Have you ever thought just how valuable the writings of Paul in the New Testament are? He wrote most of the New Testament. Tony Brim Ministries presents the following Bible teaching session entitled, The Letters of Paul, Part 1. We have a treasure from God called the Bible. And if you notice your Bible, of course we know the Old Testament, the Law and the Prophets and Psalms and in the New Testament. We have the Gospels and the Book of Acts. And starting from Romans all the way through Hebrews, you have what is called the Letters of Paul. The Bible books were not books as we have them in our Bible now, but they were originally written as letters to people or to churches. And we have the opportunity today to look at some of Paul's letters. The letters of Paul, part one. Paul wrote the epistles and he gave instructions to the church. If we did not have the epistles, the writings of Paul and others, there would be a lot of things missing that we would not know how to do and how to live, how to conduct our life as an individual, how to conduct ourselves in the church, how to reach out and be more like Christ. We have the letters of Paul that are given to us. And our golden text is Romans 1.16. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The gospel. Paul spent his entire ministry talking about the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. The good news says that we can be born again, we can be sanctified, we can be spirit-filled, we can live like Jesus. Paul spent his entire ministry and all the writings of the New Testament that we have to try to get us to conform more to the image of Christ. That's what his theme was. Be more like Jesus. Live more like Jesus. Act more like Jesus. And he spent his ministry. That's what the Bible and the New Testament, especially in the epistles of Paul and the others, are all about. To be more like him. And he tells us that we can be right with God. I'm glad that we can know, we can have a sure enough and no so salvation. We can be right with God. We don't have to wonder about it. We don't have to second guess whether we can have a relationship with God or not. We can know Him. We can have a relationship with Him. We can be made right with God. In the text verse it talks about that gospel being the power of God unto salvation. The gospel has to lead us to salvation. We can read something or hear something and it can sound pretty good to us but if it doesn't lead us to salvation it's not the gospel. The gospel is the good news, the power of God. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. And that covers everybody. Yeah. The gospel covers everyone who believes. And even if you don't believe, it brings you to Christ so you can believe. For therein, that is therein in the gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Several times in the New Testament, Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4 is quoted, the just shall live by faith. And here in Romans is quoted, the gospel reveals the righteousness of God from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. The gospel tells us the righteousness of God. You cannot find righteousness in the law. The law shows how holy God is, but it also shows how sinful we are. You could not be made righteous in the law. As long as you were doing it, you were okay. But the minute you messed up in one point, you're guilty of all of it. And that's the way it is in the law. But the righteousness of God is revealed through faith in the gospel. 
And the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. When you have the truth, you have access to the truth, but you hold it in unrighteousness. That is, you don't respond to the truth in the right way. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all the ungodliness. Just like the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against those who do not submit themselves to the gospel. You might say, well, I just don't believe the gospel. I'm not going to serve God. I'm not going to listen to what the preacher says. I'm not going to serve Jesus. Then there's no other fate but one for you, and that is the wrath of God is poured out upon those who do not believe. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power in Godhead, so that they are without excuse. All you have to do is look around and listen and just be alive, be in the world, and you can know the birds sing, the trees, the leaves that are coming off, all kind of signs and all kind of proofs. The invisible things of Him from the creation of God are clearly seen by the things that are made and things that are all around us. We can see evidence of the Godhead. We can see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. You can see it in all kind of ways. Clouds, the wind, and the rain. You can take an egg, boil that egg. You've got the shell, the white, and the yolk. That's just an example. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Trinity is seen, the Godhead. There's evidence and witness of it. And it says they are without excuse. Even if a man cannot read and write, he can hear the good news of the gospel of salvation and get saved. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. We can see that in our world today. Intelligent people, brilliant people, they have a lot of education. They got PhDs and DDs and all kind of Ds out beside their name. But they don't have sense enough to get out of the rain. That's right. Amen. They don't have sense enough to make an honest choice. They got to cheat and lie and steal. They profess themselves to be wise, but they become fools. Chapter 3 of Romans talks about the righteousness of God and those who have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. The law and the prophets, the Old Testament, gives witness to the righteousness of God. But the righteousness of God is seen not in the law, but outside of the law, where there came one who fulfilled the law, and now we see the righteousness of God that is seen without the law, and the law is being witnessed by the law and the prophets, witness the righteousness of God. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. There's no difference. If you believe, it doesn't matter whether you red, yellow, black, or white. It doesn't matter whether you're Jew or Gentile, what your nationality is, color or kind. The important thing is you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be saved. Yes. There is no difference. And also, there's no difference because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That takes in every one of us. Every one of us originally were sinners. We were born in sin, and when we grew up and we got old enough, we became accountable, we became answerable to sin, and all of us have sinned. I don't care how good of a preacher, an apostle, a prophet that he is, all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Yes. And even as believers, now we're not sinners anymore, but we still come short of the glory of God. Because the glory of God is Jesus Christ. And anybody under that comes short of the glory of God. Amen. He is the fulfillment of all Scripture. He is the express image of the Father's person. 
And we can be right with God simply by putting our faith and trust in Him. Romans 5, 1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Just by putting your faith and trust in Christ, we have peace with God. Our peace does not depend on which political party wins. Our peace does not depend on who the preacher in the church is. Our peace does not depend on how things are going in the world. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ because we're justified by faith. We have faith in Christ and we have access into one spirit to the Father and we have believed on Him. We're justified by faith and we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He gives you peace with God and therefore you can have peace with each other. You can lay your head on your pillow at night and you can have peace no matter what's going on around you. Well, there's a lot of people who believe that they're just too lost to be saved. But God loves us no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been. In verse 8 of Romans 5 says that God commended His love toward us and that we were yet sinners while we were sinners. Christ died for us. He didn't wait until we were good enough. He didn't wait until we were dressed up and born again. We couldn't be born again unless He had died for us. But He died for us. Even when we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And God showed His love toward us. He extended and commended His love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You can be right with God. Thank God. And Paul's writings show us, like no other, that a person can be right with God. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. We are not condemned anymore because we're living for Jesus Christ. That old condemnation, that old guilt, all that has passed away. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. If we as believers could get a hold of that one verse, it would revolutionize, it would change our lives. We are made free. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. We're not bound by sin anymore. We're not bound by death. And even though we're still subject to death, we're not bound by it. Amen. We're subject to death. We may pass through the valley of the shadow of death, but we can say like David, I will fear no evil. Because death is not the final answer. Death is not the final thing. Death is just a passage into life. Because when you have Jesus Christ, you're born again. You're born twice, die once. But if you're only born once, you die twice. And nobody wants to be a part of that second death. Separation from God forever. The writings of Paul give what is called apostolic correction and counsel. We would not have much of what we have to help the church if Paul had not written to us and God had not preserved this word. 1 Corinthians 3, the big thing there is spirituality and carnality. I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto babes, as unto carnal. I could not speak to you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able. For ye are yet carnal, for where is there is among you envying and strife and divisions? Are you not carnal and walk as men? And that last part of that verse is, Are you not carnal and walk like men of the world? That is a shameful thing to have said about someone who claims to be born again. That we have a relationship with God, but yet sometimes we act like people of the world. We walk, as Paul says, like men. We walk as lost men is the idea. And carnality will kill us. Spirituality gives you life. Carnality kills you. And it leads you astray. 
divisions, envies, all these things. When we're involved in these things, there's no way that you can be involved in envy and strife and all this and yet be a successful carrier out of the Great Commission. You cannot do both of those things at one time. Now I know people can multitask. Ladies especially, they do five things at one time. Us men, we can't even do two things at one time. We say, George, hand me the hammer. Whoa, 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 wait, wait a minute. Let me put the screwdriver down. But the lady, she can talk on the phone, take care of the computer, watch over the children, and make sure the dinner don't burn. Isn't it wonderful how God put us to sleep and made a beautiful woman? And even if they're not beautiful, they're still beautiful in God's eyes. There's a woman of beauty and a beautiful woman. But all this strife and envy and things that are going on, he says, you're carnal, you're walking like men. And all throughout the Bible, he sought, especially his writings, he sought to conform us to the image of Christ, to help us to grow up into the Him, to grow up as sons and daughters. We are sons and daughters of the King. We're King's kids. We're King's sons and King's daughters. We don't have to be a little yeah, yeah, yeah baby. We don't have to be that way all of our spiritual life. We want to grow up, and we want to grow up into the head who is Christ. Verse 9 of that chapter, We are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. You're part of the building. And He wants you to grow up into a holy temple in the Lord. And Galatians says the same thing that if Ephesians and that Corinthians said, O oh, foolish Galatians, he said in chapter 3, verse 1, Who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth and crucified among you? Paul preached the gospel so real that Christ was like on a movie screen there in front of them. They could almost see him there being crucified and buried and risen before them. He has been set forth and crucified in evidence among you. And now you cannot afford to be bewitched. You cannot afford to be beguiled. This only would I learn of you, he says. Received you the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? It has to be on one plateau, on one basis or the other. It either has to be by law or by grace. It has to be by law or by faith. If it's by law or by works, that's one thing. But if it's by grace and by faith, that's another thing. Of course, we receive the Holy Spirit. We receive Jesus Christ through the hearing of faith. It's not anything to do with the works of the law. Even as Abraham, he said, if you want a good example, look at Abraham. Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And that's the same way you and I do. We believe God, and it's counted to us for righteousness. Know ye that they which are of faith the same are the children of Abraham. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. And he wants to make sure that we understand that Abraham believed God, and God honored his faith. The same way that you and I, if Abraham can believe God under the old covenant, and have righteousness stamped to his account, surely you and I under the new covenant could have righteousness stamped to our account. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident. For the just shall live by faith. There it is again, quoted in Galatians. The just shall live by faith. The law is not of faith. As long as you do them, you're living. But the moment you quit doing, you quit living as far as the law is concerned. But that's not what faith is. Under the law... You did to live. Under faith, you live so you can do. And we have faith, and it encourages us to live right. It encourages us to do right. We can do right, and we can live right because of faith. And the law, you tried, you did pretty well for a while, and then you failed and you came short. Always coming short. Always had to bring another sacrifice. But in grace and faith... Even though you may come short, you can still keep on trucking because your grace and your faith 
does not leave you, does not forsake you, because you don't forsake it, and you don't forsake Him. And He is always with us. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. He hung on the tree for you, He hung on the tree for me. He became our curse. We are delivered from the curse of the law. The curse of the law is not over us. It does not bind us anymore. Because Christ has delivered us from the curse of the law. He became our curse. He hung on a tree. And that's what God said. He who hangs on a tree, Moses said, is a curse of God. Who would have thought that that curse... It would put on all these bad criminals that raped and killed and robbed people. And they would be hung on a tree. They were cursed of God. Who would have thought that that curse would be rolled over onto God's only begotten blessed Son who never did anything wrong. But yet the curse was rolled over on Him and He became our curse that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. That's how we receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. The blessing of Abraham is passed on to the Gentiles. How in the world could a Gentile get in to the same subscription, to the same salvation that a Jew had? It has to be because of faith. It's not because of genealogy it's not because of race it's not because of being a son or daughter of abraham physically it's because of faith faith bridges that gap faith jumps over that circumcision uncircumcision flesh jew gentile faith jumps over all that faith jumps over those denominational barriers baptist methodist pentecostal church of god presbyterian faith jumps over all that. It matters not so much whether Pentecostal, Baptist, Methodist, what matters is that you're a member of the church of Jesus Christ. Amen. Part of the body of Christ, and then you can be whatever you feel like that God wants you to be. Of course, the full gospel. We need to be a part of a church who preaches the full gospel. We can know that we're right with God. We can have apostolic counsel and guidance from the apostle himself and from Jesus Christ, who is a great apostle. And one of the things that Paul's writing talks about, 1 Corinthians 15, is the significance of the resurrection. We, thank God, have the hope of the resurrection. They were teaching some of them that there was no resurrection. Teaching had gotten out. This thing about false teaching just didn't start now. It was been going on a long time. And one of the teachings that had gotten out was the resurrection. There is no resurrection, and if there is one, it's already passed. He said if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? If you're going to persist in teaching that there's no resurrection, that means that Christ didn't rise. And if Christ is not risen, there is no use to keep on trying. If Christ is not risen, then is our preaching vain and your faith is also vain. He even said, it's like you're still in your sins. If Christ is not risen from the dead, we're just hopelessly lost. We're professing a religion, a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. But now is Christ risen from the dead? and become the first fruits of them that slept. He's the first one to rise, and we'll all rise after him one of these days. And in verses 51 and 52, 1 Corinthians 15, Behold, I show you a mystery. One old timer reading the King James Version, he said he had his shoes on, he said right here, Behold, I show you a mystery. Well, Paul said, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Everyone won't die. Some will be living and alive when Jesus comes. We'll not all sleep, but we'll all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Three things happen when the rapture takes place. One, the trumpet sounds. Two, the dead in Christ rise. Three, we'll all be changed. And what a day that will be. 
When my Jesus I shall see, when I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. What a day, a glorious day that's going to be. Thank God for the resurrection. No matter what happens in this world, no matter what discouragement, no matter what kind of lies that are told, no matter what kind of cheating and stealing that's going on, and so much violence and looting and killing and uncertainty in our world today. But the foundation of God stands true. Jesus Christ is still the cornerstone. And His Word stands true. It hasn't changed. If you read it 20 years ago and you read it today, it says the same thing now it did 20 years ago. His Word is forever true. All around the shifting sands they may change and shift and go here and there the tide goes in and goes out God's word is still the same and some glorious daybreak Jesus will come some glorious daybreak when day is done Jesus is coming again that wonderful song says, Jesus is coming soon, morning or night or noon. Many will meet their doom, trumpets will sound. All the dead will rise, righteous meet in the skies. Heavenward bound, glory to share. Jesus is coming again. If you have no joy and no happiness about anything else, you can be happy that Jesus is coming again. Father, thank you for the letters of Paul. Thank you for the Bible. Thank you for the writings of one who suffered himself so much. Stoned, shipwrecked, ridiculed, persecuted. But he fought the battle and he won. He ran the race and he went all the way so that we could have the Bible that we have today. And I thank you, Lord, for preserving your word for somebody like me to hear the gospel and be saved. May many come to that realization of Jesus Christ today. In his name I pray. Amen. You have been listening to a Bible teaching session entitled, The Letters of Paul, Part 1. Paul desires that we become more like Jesus Christ. I hope and trust that you have made Him your Savior and your Lord. If not, do so today. This has been a production of Tony Broom Ministries.